We are doing our last, uh, our final uh, look at the book of Psalms. If you are counting, we've done four. We did a stop, it's 150 chapters, and we've done four topical stops. We did, a, they've all been overviews and summaries. Um, but I, I wanted to uh, share with you that we are stopping tonight to do something. We're gonna actually go, you're gonna hear a lot of scripture. But we're actually going to talk about something that I think every minister really wants. The main aim of all these, uh, this, this survey of the Old Testament is to, you to see Jesus in the Old Testament, not illegitimately, but legitimately, because he's the word made flesh, dwells among us, or dwelt among us, and still dwells among us. It's also to get you to love God's word. Um, so tonight, what we're going to talk about in our last, our final Psalms look is how to develop a friendship with God. We're going to talk about three issues that stand in the way of developing a friendship with God. And then right out of the Psalms and looking up into the New Testament, we'll move toward Jesus and, and this, uh, just how the scriptures instruct us to do this sort of thing and uh, give, us, give us guidance and uh, qualification. Um, one of the things uh, I... I wanted to quote for you is, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll move to it here in a second, um, is when I was looking at great, great people of the past in the, in the history of the faith over 2,000 years, I was looking at people and what they would say about the Psalms, and some did years in the Psalms, uh, some uh, have done entire books on the Psalms, I've got my favorite commentators on the Psalms, uh, incredible, but one of the things you want, I, I really want is for you to use the Psalms to use them, to incorporate them in your devotional life. After all, this is Jesus' songbook. This is the songbook of, of Jesus uh, and the disciples, and it's a, uh, it's a, <laughs> it's something that should be a, well, there's two different ways of, of, of thinking about worship. One is the normative principle, one's the regulative principle. The normative principle is whatever the scriptures don't tell you not, they tell you, they, they don't warn you about, have fun be free, right? The regulative principle is let's try to get as close as we can to the word, even in our singing and in our prayers. Uh, that can become legalistic for sure, but uh, we're going to look at some of these things tonight. Uh, if we could put the, uh, the quote up, the Prince of Preachers, Charles H. Haddon Spurgeon, said probably the aim tonight better than I could, so I will quote my better here. The delightful study of the Psalms has yielded me boundless profit and ever-growing pleasure. Common gratitude, my common thanks, constrains me to communicate to others a portion of that benefit with the prayer that it may induce all of you, my brothers and sisters, to search them further yourselves or themselves. Spurgeon said it better than I could. That's it. Utilize the Psalms, appreciate them, bring them into your devotional life, and see your champion, Jesus, in them. Amen? So that's what we're going to attempt, <clears throat> attempt to do uh, tonight as we uh, continue to look at the, at the scriptures. So um, we know that one of the prayer types or song types or poem types in the Psalms is adoration. That's simply adoring God. We're going to find most of our... Um, most of our instruction out of the psalm are going to come from adoration type psalms. They're going to they're give us this. A lot of the things we're talking about, we're going to be talking about tonight, would have been found in Psalm 119 in Pastor Tim's uh, exposition of Psalm 119 last week. But I wanted to start with the idea, some people would say, you shouldn't even talk about a friendship with God because they don't believe they, that there's a number of issues. There's three major issues we're going to talk about. But the first thing you need to know is this. The scriptures indicate friendships possible with God. Believe it or not, there are people that have a problem uh, theoretically, scripturally. So let me read to you these two passages. And you may say, great, Walva Hill, that's Moses and Abraham. I'm just, I, you know, I'm just a, a, <laughs> a lowly post-Jesus Christian. Don't think that way. But listen uh, to God's word here. Exodus 33, 11. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp. But his young age, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. How about moving up to one of the larger, what we call major prophets, uh, right before and during the exile of Israel, Jeremiah 9.24. But let the one who boasts, boast about this, 
that they have understanding to know me that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight. That they have understanding to know me, I delight. A friend that delights in the people of Israel, his chosen people. And then last, Isaiah 41, 8, arguably the alpha prophet in the Old Testament. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend. My friend. So I want to start with just saying, okay, first we know it's scriptural. Friendship with God's possible. And then we're going to look at four issues. One, the first issue with somebody saying even the concept of becoming a friend of God is what's called the respect issue. The respect issue. I'll give it to you very quickly. The respect issue is this. You know, Joe, it's this kind of I want to be buddies with God that gives you the buddy Jesus idea. This is the one where there's so much disrespect given because it's flippant. I have a a couple of uh, friends at different uh, Christian universities that are theology guys that say, you know, whenever people talk about friendship with God, it usually is to give them license to do whatever they want. Yeah, God's like a friend, like my friend at the frat house or my friend at the... So there's a disrespect issue going on there um, that people are concerned about, that friend's a little too flippant and our, 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 our concept of friendship is too small. Surely... But if the scriptures use friend and friendship with God, then even the respect issue can be overcome, amen? It doesn't mean the minute you start calling God friend, he's like, what's up, bud? And Jesus is going to morally accept everything you do, buddy Jesus, right? The second issue is a cultural issue. Second issue is a cultural issue, and it's this. You hear one of the things that people say all the time is that, well, friendship with God is okay, but it's only okay on my terms, because after all, I'm spiritual, not religious. Anybody heard this? This is, this is the... Uh, most common claim of people that don't really want to read the word or go to church. I'm spiritual, not religious. There is a Christian version of it. I'm not religious like the Pharisees or the legalists. But most of the time it's people saying, here's, here's the, the translation. I'd like to have a sense of awe and wonder about God, but I don't want anything else. I don't want anything else. Um, I, I don't want doctrine. I don't want dogma. I don't, I don't want any of these things. I want to have a, a sense of something bigger than me. I want God to affect my feelings, but I want it on my terms. I want it on my terms. So therefore, you don't, you, 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 the, these are the, this is the kind of approach where somebody says a religious person, it, traditional religion tells you where you've gone wrong and how to correct it, right? Spirituality tells you everything you're doing is a-okay, and you're great, and what you're doing is great. So it's, it's, I'm spiritual, not religious, is a second big issue and say, well, okay, if there is a possibility of a friendship with God, it's going to be all on my terms and I'll decide just how much I'll engage in. What I don't want is this God to tell me I'm doing anything wrong or that I have to change. What you hardly hear somebody say that says they're spiritual, you never hear these words come out. Boy, I'm feeling convicted. Gosh, I need to repent. Uh, I, I, I've got to change. I need a trajectory change. The Holy Spirit, I need help. To, I, I've got to stop. You don't hear that right? What you hear is, you know, God's bigger than our thoughts about it. It's truisms, but always about, I'm really trying to get a feeling here. One of the best uh, ways to summarize it uh, is, is this way, right? The, the, I want connection, but no consequence. This is not mine. I want to be awed with no austerity, and I want to be inspired without instruction. The pr- there's, a, there's about a dozen problems with this uh, that you run into if you think about it just for a moment. Um, one is that you don't really, there, knowledge doesn't work this way. Uh, if you uh, are, are trying to learn about a friend, and there's a connection between human relationships and, and God, a relationship with God, there's a connection, friendship he does desire it with. It's one of the uniques about our faith. But if somebody comes to you and, and says they're spiritual, not religious, and that means my thoughts about the, the metaphysics, the supernatural, the afterlife, God, <laughs> are equal to the, the knowledge, the religious knowledge traditions that have spanned centuries, that have inspired billions of people, you wouldn't accept that in any other area. You know, it's like you going up here to FGCU and you're like, I'm, I'm paying to learn about chemistry. And so, you know what, I really like chemistry. I got some thoughts about chemistry. I'm really fond of chemistry. I had a real chemical, awesome chemical connection I had when I had my coffee this morning. I'd like to teach today. That's not how knowledge works. That's not how, that's not how learning somebody works. You don't, that's not, you don't get more and more adept at anything by becoming more and more vague about it. And that's the whole spirituality approach. I don't want to hear any parameters. I don't want to hear any dogma. I don't want to hear any of that. I don't want to hear any doctrine. Doctrines for losers. We can't really know anyway. It's metaphysical. It's not physical. And that leads to our last issue. And I hope 
uh, this will help. It probably deserves its own series. Um, it's my opinion that the second biggest problem people have with attempting to be Christians or coming to Jesus Christ is the idea that you're, uh, Joe, you're advocating an, a relationship with an invisible and audible being. Uh, God's not made of matter. He's too big for a body. Light doesn't strike his body. Um, there are times where he has manifested his presence. You ever had that? You're in a church service on Sunday. <laughs> you're like, God is here. And you're like, well, yeah, he's omnipresent. No, no, no. We're talking about his manifest presence. He is affecting our emotions. He's, he's doing something to us. It's the idiom the Hebrews used is seeking the face of God. There's about a dozen and a half good reasons to think about. I think you need to think seriously about what good reasons God has for not being visible to us. Is it impossible? It's imaginary friend versus invisible friend. But invisible doesn't mean unable and it doesn't mean unreal, okay? It certainly doesn't mean that. There's a lot of things you can't detect with your eyes or ears or your five senses empirically that are nonetheless real. But there are at least two good reasons, again, you could just real quick, that this shouldn't stop you from attempting a relationship with God simply because there's a problem with him not being physically available to you. You can't see it like a pizza or a chair. You can't see God in that way. One issue is this. It turns out if you read the Bible closely that God is so holy that it looks like a holy God's proximity to a sinful, rebellious person is lethal. You see this in the Old Testament. It can kill you. God is so holy and pure that proximity to God for a rebellious person can actually kill you. So it could definitely be the sin that's present in our lives. It could be the sin that's obvious to us or not obvious to us. One of the reasons God isn't physically present to us at all times. There's another good reason as well, and I wanted to read you uh, this from uh, one of those dumb Christians that's really superstitious, just one of the greatest geniuses in, the, in, in Western culture's history, Blaise Pascal. The genius inventor, if you like your cell phone, thank Blaise Pascal. If you like barometers, thank Blaise Pascal. Uh, you know, really advanced the calculator, you know, coming after the abacus all the way to where he's at. I had a conversion experience, uh, almost dying in a carriage ride, a carriage accident. Uh, his sister got miraculously healed of it. Uh, yep. Blaise Pascal said this about hiddenness of God. I'm going to restrain. Listen to Pascal on the hiddenness of God. Any religion that denies the hiddenness of God, not visible to your eyes, cannot be true. And any religion that fails to explain the hiddenness of God cannot really teach. So Pascal uh, himself uh, died prematurely, earlier than he expected himself uh, to die and left his about three-fourths finish, his book called Pensees, which just means thoughts. One more thing, again, I, I hope you think deeply about the hiddenness of God. And again, I think between that and the problem, maybe those are the biggest issues for modern Westerners to come to God. They just, you know, how do I know this isn't an imaginary being? Um, the other reason that God isn't manifestly available to us is not just because he's, he cares for us, but God isn't that um, concerned about whether you believe he only exists. I mean, even though you got Hebrews 4, right? Hebrews 4 says, uh, sorry, Hebrews 11 says, the great faith chapter says, right, you must believe God exists and he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Whoa, we have to diligently seek him? Why didn't you just write him, I'm the author of this on the moon so everybody can see it? Because God's not just interested in what? In just you believing he exists. He wants to improve you and be in a love relationship with you. And that means there's gonna have to be something that comes in between a direct blast of his presence to you. If you think just for a second, you have this problem. Imagine uh, how hard it was for Bill Gates to date. Bill Gates, you know, so he's a billionaire. Everybody knows him, right? He knows he's, <laughs> he's not so easy on the eyes. But how, does he, how is he sure somebody really loves him? How? Same with God. God blasts you with his power all the time. You come to him because he's a genie. Now you're the gold digger that comes to God. If God blasts you with his presence and, and power and you get scared, now you're coming to him so he doesn't turn you into a grease spot. So if God wants to have a friendship, love relationship with you, his presence is going to have to be mediated. You need space to say no to him. Did you know that, that, that that's one of the most important things about somebody going to the altar? That they weren't forced to go there? Forced love is rape. So the hiddenness of God is a blessing, right? Even though there's times like, I want to see you, I want to see your face, Lord. Becky Toos. But it is a mercy to us because there needs to be space. If the bride or the groom can't say no, they're being forced, that's not real love. So a blasting of his presence to you would either scare you into believing in him or would either make you believe in him only. And Jesus had to deal with this. Multiplies the fishes and the loaves and they're like, make him a king. Why? Because we don't want to do any agra agrarian work anymore. He goes away and weeps after that miracle. Withdraws from the, anyway. 
Listen to Pascal on this. God wants a love relationship with you. By the way, you know the demons know Jesus exists, even now, after his physical. The demons know God exists. They're more certain than you and I are, but they don't have a love relationship with him. So, so listen to Pascal here on this point. Again, there's a dozen reasons why he's hidden. It was not then right that God should appear in a manner manifestly divine all the time. Remember Jesus, you know, his, uh, his transfiguration. And completely capable of convincing all men and women, all humans. But it is also not right that he should come in so hidden in a manner so he could not be known by those who would sincerely seek him. He has willed to make himself, listen, appear openly to those who seek him with all their heart and be hidden from those who flee from him with all their heart. He so regulates the knowledge of himself that he has given signs of himself visible to those who seek him and not to those who seek him not. That's not a cheap excuse. So don't let this get in your way that can you have, can you have a relationship with an invisible and audible friend? That shouldn't get in your way. That's, part of that is because of our, our dogged adherence to uh, things needing to be physical in order to be real. Um, okay, so one last, one last uh, issue and then we'll move on. Um, just a little background. C.S. Lewis wrote a beautiful little book, real little book, Reflections on the Psalms. I want to commend it to you. It's really, really good. It's not hard to get through. It's not too dense. But he said something in, uh, in one of his works, not the Reflections on Psalms, where he said, okay, think of the, di- the four different types of love in the Greek language as eros is you're looking at each other you're enraptured in each other's presence eros love that's a romantic love he said the other type brotherly love phileo right philadelphia delpho city phila brotherly love city of brotherly love a brotherly love is a friendship where you're both looking at something go you like that too i like that you like that we have this in common we can appreciate extol this together that's that common that common bond now Along comes somebody that Lewis was aware of named Aristotle, right? You have Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Aristotle said, you know what? I'll tell you this. He said two incredible things, even though he wasn't, they weren't necessarily familiar with the Greek culture or with the Jewish culture. When the Greeks ascended to superpower, super, uh, superpower status, he said, one, if a God ever became a human and dwelt among us, we'd all kill him because we couldn't stand perfection in our midst. Isn't that interesting? That was, that was said by Aristotle. He also said this, forget about this whole talk about friendship. You know why? Because friendship requires commonality. And God is too different than humans, right? There's too much of a power differential, perspective differential, too much of a, of, of a, um, a knowledge differential. So Aristotle said you can't do it. There's too much difference to have that common phileo type friendship love with God, with any deity. And this is interesting too, why? Because he was in a culture that had, I mean, hundreds of gods that were all modeled after human beings to kind of bridge the gap between them. But two things shouldn't trip you up about Aristotle. Here's the first one. Again, I wish I could expand, but the Trinity, since God has existed in eternity's past, has always been a community of friendship and love. Um, Gosh. First and foremost, the reason why Aristotle's challenge shouldn't bother us is because the two great mysteries that are the, some of the essentials of our faith, one is the Trinity. God has always been in a loving relationship. So relationships aren't foreign to him. In fact, the love relationship is one that always moves out in service and love and, and goodness to others, right? Husband, wife, kids, grandkids, friends, strangers, always looking out. Same thing with God. Trinitarian love overflowed into creation. Second, Jesus was the God-man, the word that was made flesh and dwelt among us. So God bridged the gap, amen, by coming among us, having friends, making friends. Again, he modeled that relationship and did it when he arrived among us. So again, Aristotle shouldn't trip you up and neither should the respect issue, neither should the the, the cultural issue, and neither should the materialistic or the the matter of physicality issue. Okay, so four quick ways the Psalms tell us and the New Testament to pursue a relationship and develop one, a friendship with God. Here's the one nobody's going to like, but it may be the most important if you take the Psalms, all 150 uh, chapters, seriously. And again, Tim couldn't get through all 176 verses of, of Psalm 119. They did a masterful job last week. Um, obedience. It's probably, obey and obedience is probably the most hated word in our culture. If our cultural idol is, do what thou wilt. Anybody gets in your way, they're the enemy. Anybody that applauds you, they're with you. Obedience as a requirement of a friendship with God is is foundational. 
You cannot uh, get away from it. It's, as they say, glowing. It's glowing from afar. It's so obvious in, uh, in God's word and especially across the Psalter. So real quick, I wanted to, um, to give you, we'll look at Psalm 119 in a second, but these are some uh, passages we're going to look at uh, that very, very clearly say, if you want to have a relationship with God, the way you get to know God is by listening to him. He doesn't speak audibly. Where do you think you go <laughs> to hear from God, right? You can hear from him in other ways. He says so in his word, but you go to his word. That's the idea. And by the way, um, uh, the culture that we're in right now specializes, they don't really understand freedom, but they want it. They know they like it and they want it. They don't really understand it. We're big on freedom from. I want freedom from constraint. I want freedom from, no, no. There's also another freedom, a freedom to be what you're supposed to be. It's not just freedom from, it's freedom to. And the Bible talks about that. It says this weird paradox that the more you put yourself under the constraints of your loving father, the more free you are. It's weird, right? The obedience paradox? I thought being more free was being, okay, give you two examples very quickly. An airplane is more free to do things that a land-based thing can't do because it honors the rules of gravity, of lift, of matter. It honors those rules because this is what it was designed to do. Therefore, the plane soars in the air, hits the water, it sinks like a stone. Well, not every plane, don't get lost in the analogy. Second, this is actually a story I actually heard was a real story, real story. Readers Digest years ago, <clears throat> there's a boy who's got severe allergies and he goes, uh, he sees at a, uh, on TV, he sees, look at these children, he's the only child, he's like, look at all these children having fun with these pets, I want uh, some cats or some dogs. And the parents are like, we can't do it, honey, we just can't. So they go, well, what can we do? We'll get him some goldfish. So they get him some goldfish and they come ask him, right? Right, the following day, like, how are they doing? He's like, well, they were frolicking for a while, but now they're not moving. He took them out of the water where they were more free, and they died. So a water, water is the environment a fish was designed for. So there's freedom within that constraint. Um, some ways theologians put it this way. Jesus and God's constraint, because they're based on our desires, or they're based on our design, are our freedom. They make us actually more free when we live uh, in obedience to the Father who designed us this way. He didn't just arbitrarily do this. He said, I know how I designed you and what purpose I have for you. Let me give you some of these scriptures here. You hear Jesus say this in John 15, 14. If you are my friend, you are my friends if you do what I command. By the way, this is audacious if Jesus isn't God. You want to be friends with me? Obey everything I say. It's not a great way to start a friendship if you're another human. If you're God, that falls in line with the rest of his word. Psalm 145, 18 through 20. The Lord is near to all who call on him, friendship, all who call on him in truth, constrained by truth, not believing lies. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him and hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches all who love him, but the wicked he will destroy. If you look through the entire five chapter run of Jesus' uh, kid brother, James, his half brother, James, you see this over and over and over and over again in this power. By the way, remember James was a skeptic of his brother like the rest of uh, Jesus' family, generally until he gets apparently appeared to by the risen, his risen brother and then gets martyred for his belief in the deity of Messiahship and resurrection of Jesus. Listen to this run of James 1 through 5. I'll just do one, one verse out of each one. James 1, 22. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. If you're a hearer only, you deceive yourself in your relationship with God. If you're just giving kind of, oh yeah, I guess I'll do it, service to God's word, you're not really in relationship with him. James 2, 12, faith and deeds. Speak and act as those who are gonna be judged by, listen, the law that gives freedom. There's that obedience paradox. How does a law, constraint, give freedom? It's based on your design and given to you from your loving creator. James three seventeen. but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy. Submissive to what? God's design and his parameters for your life. Full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. These are some of the things you should be acting in accordance with, with your neighbors, other image bearers of God, if you say you're in relationship with God. James 4, 7 through 8, submit yourselves to God. Why do we have to submit? I thought this is a friendship. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he'll come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. 
James 5, 16, finally, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. A prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. An obedient person is someone who's in relationship with God. Now again, you're like, who can do this? Nobody can be perfectly obedient. That's, we ask for Holy Spirit help. We don't depend on ourselves for this sort of thing. So if you have communication with God, you have to have a relationship where you can be corrected, where you can have a trajectory change. Where you, that's, you know, you don't really even have a marriage, you know that? If, if you can never be corrected, you can never be um, called out by a friend, you don't really have a relationship. You may be in relationship with somebody, but that's not a marriage and it's not a real friendship. Psalm 66, 16 through 20, come and hear all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he's done for me. I cried out with, to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. Sounds like a friendship to me. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. What is it to cherish sin in your heart? This is my sin. This is my identity. I've got to have this or I'm not, a, I'm not the person I think I am. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and heard my prayer. Praise be to God. He has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. Um, uh, this is a statue of a gentleman that was one of the most respected uh, political philosophers, I mean, political philosopher, political philosopher and statesman uh, in the uh, 18th century, Edmund Burke. Listen to what Burke said about a culture like Europe and one that was being built like the United States. Listen to Burke here. It has to do with these constraints freeing us in some way. These, these rules of God not being burdensome. These things that we're supposed to obey Jesus are for our good, not for ill. Men are qualified. Humans are qualified for civil liberty in the exact proportion to their disposition to put moral chains on their own appetites. Wait a second. Did he say you're most free when you put chains on all, on, uh, not all, but on some of your appetites? Sounds like not a smart guy. Sounds like a crazy guy. In proportion as their love to justice is above their rapacity, their, their immorality. In proportion as their soundness and sobriety of understanding is above their vanity and presumption. In proportion as they are more disposed to listen to the counsels of the wise and the good and pre in preference to the flattery of knaves that want to manipulate them. Society cannot exist unless a controlling power upon will and appetite be placed somewhere. And the less of it, it is, there is within, the more there must be constraining without. More rules for le if you have less internal controls, you're going to have to have more external controls. It is ordained in the eternal constitution of all things that men and women of intemperate minds cannot really be free. Their passions forge their fetters. If you're free to do anything you want, anytime you want, all the time, you're, op you're going to operate against your design, this side of eternity. And therefore, you're going to create your own prison. One of the most popular podcasters out there is an, uh, a retired Navy SEAL named Jocko Willink. One of the axioms that's on every podcast and said almost in every podcast by him over and over again is what? Discipline equals freedom. Wait a second. Discipline means I constrain my freedom to have a better freedom in the future. All the time. All the time. Last example. It's one of my favorites. I know you're going to be like, whatever. Um, <laughs> Charlotte Bronte, uh, I've had arguments for years over whether Bronte or Austin's better, but anyway, in her, in, in her, probably her most famous book, Bronte's famous book is Jane Eyre. And I won't ruin the book for you, but there's a moment where Mr. Rochester's fallen in love with a maid in his home named Jane. And Jane is a very devout Christian woman. Um, and he's like, look, I, I've fallen in love with you, and here's the secret. My wife went crazy a couple years ago. And... I want to be with you romantically. I, I'm not going to kill her, and she's not sick. She gets sick sometimes, but she literally is out of her mind. I could take you up there, but I don't need to. So can we engage in a romance and maybe get married? And Jane's torn because there's no specific Bible injunction about insane spouses. And she feels like, I, I feel like I'm doing something wrong if I do this. I know it says till death do them part. I, I don't know if I can do it. Listen to what what, uh, this is incredible, <laughs> what Bronte writes and puts in, uh, in Jane's mouth. So Rochester's like, look, no one's going to be hurt by this. No one's even going to know we're romantically involved. There's a couple of servants in the house, but they want me to be with someone else. It's not going to hurt anybody. My wife's gone mentally. She's not even there. Jane responds to Rochester, I will keep the law given by God concerning marriage sanctioned by man, held up by the laws of man. I will hold the principles received by me when I was sane and not mad as I am now. Laws and principles are not for the times when there's no temptation. They are for such moments as this when body and soul rise in mutiny. 
against those laws, stringent as they are and violent as they shall be. If at my individual convenience I might break them, what would be the worth of God's rules, God's law? God's law? They have a worth, so I have always believed. And if I cannot now believe it now, it is because I'm insane, quite insane. My veins are running with fire. She's in love with him. My heart is beating faster than I can count its throbs. Preconceived opinions, foregone determinations are all I have at this hour to stand by. There I plant my foot. Now she should have had, Holy Spirit, give me power. I need power to keep this. And she leaves, leaves him. He says, God bless you for your kindness. I won't ruin the end of the story. That isn't where it ends, but it's almost to the end. It's the penultimate uh, segment. But listen to what she's saying. God's law and restraints don't mean much, right, if they don't cost in some way, or at least feel like they cost in some way before I can see uh, the benefit. Uh, for sure. So costly heating of parameters, as you get that there, a long sacrificial obedience and what this theologians call in the same direction, a long sacrificial obedience in the same direction is something that looks like a bare bones basic. Not a drudgery, but a bare bones basic if you're going to have a friendship with God. And again, th- when you can't keep it perfectly, that's okay. You're not supposed to keep it perfectly. You're supposed to have Holy Spirit power, that Jesus is supposed to come alongside you and help you keep these things and see things you couldn't normally see without leaning in on Him. Psalm 119, 165 through 176. Listen, great peace have those who love your law. I don't, if you can't get it here, I don't know where you're going to get it. And nothing can make them stumble. I wait for your salvation, Lord, as I follow your commands. I obey your statutes, for I love them greatly. I obey your precepts and your statutes, for all my ways are known to you. May, may my cry come before you, Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. May my supplication... <clears throat> Come before you, deliver me according to your promise. May my lips overflow with praise, for you teach me your decrees. May my tongue sing of your word, for all your commands are righteous. May your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, Lord. Your law gives me delight. Let me live that I may praise you, that, that your laws may sustain me. I've strayed like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I've not forgotten your commands. I'm seeking you, but I haven't kept your commands. I've got to keep your commands, but I need help to do it. Right there in Psalm 119, the great, the great chapter there. Second, very quickly, the second thing you need to believe is that this isn't all on you. You know what the great, the great mistake is about somebody who's a striving to be obedient? You become legalistic, you think it's all about you, and you've earned your salvation. It's a common problem, right? So salvation by faith alone through Jesus' work is required here. The key is God doesn't owe you. I've done all these things, now he owes me. You know, I doubled up my devotions this week. I still got an offender bender. No, 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 got it wrong. Salvation, right, comes through what? Justification by faith alone. You see this uh, even pushed around in the first psalm there. Um, If you don't understand this about your relationship with God, if you don't understand this about God, what you'll think of God is as a boss and you'll have a mercenary relationship with him. I did X, Y, Z. I went to church four Sundays in a row. I've heard people say this to me on the phone. Now, where's the blessing? Where's the blessing? Um, So that's number two. Number three, and this is going to be, it's going to ruffle some people, but the third is that you have a two-way dynamic communication. That means not just praying, verbalizing, but listening. Listening to God. Sometimes prayer is what some theologians call a flare. You just throw it up. What's the shortest prayer in the Bible? Have mercy on me, Lord. Um, Sometimes a prayer is a flare. You see this in Psalm 61, just kind of a send up. Things are going really wrong. God, just help, 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 Lord. But it's supposed to be, in general, a two way communication. That means there needs to be time where you listen. What do I listen to? He's inaudible. (laughs) Right? Now, sometimes you hear that still small voice in your conscience, right? But what does the Word of God direct us to listen to? His Word. His Word. It can be really difficult when there's no specifics. Remember Jane Eyre? Well, there's nothing specifically about an insane spouse in the Bible. But she said, no, 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 there's something about the precepts and the laws that even if they're hard, I should probably stick with them. So move away from feelings, move towards God's word. I thought you'd, I tried Babylon B in here before. This is a satire site. Man sitting literally three feet from Bible, ask God to speak to him. Why won't you speak to me, Lord? So uh, yeah, you go to the word as your guide, right? This is the inspired word of God. It's not the only way God speaks, but it's the primary way God speaks. So we have to listen to him speak to us through his word. This is why it's important, believe it or not, if you're seeking an answer, you come on a Sunday morning, Pastor Russ is giving you God's word and helping you see the application points. That's the idea. That's the idea any preacher or teacher is supposed to show you. You can mine God's word for this. You can mine God's word for this. Um, 
probably the, probably the best known named evangelist and preacher, George Whitfield. Um, wasn't, uh, you know, had a lot of hard times in his life. We don't tend to focus on that because he did so many, I mean, died prematurely, uh, dealt with uh, being a public figure and having a, a cross eye. Um, but George Whitfield, um, George Whitfield uh, went publicly before uh, his congregation, before he really started, he started traveling and became this very, very popular outdoor preacher, uh, Great Awakening. Whitfield, at one point, his son fell very, very ill. And he went before his congregation and said this, God told me in prayer the other night that my son will be the next great preacher that will succeed me. His son died two weeks later. And he didn't hide that. He went before the congregation and said, I mistook God's will and something I didn't see directly in the word as just fatherly compassion. My heart is broken, but I, I mistakenly told you something I thought I heard from the Lord. He owned it. He owned it. Everybody, it's funny, even the reporters that couldn't stand him and any of the other pastors that were jealous of him were hoping this was the end of his preaching career. He actually got more crowds, the more honest he was. So George Whitfield, uh, again, the, 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 the great um, English and then American evangelist and uh, pastor. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is alive and active. It's not just words on a page. It's alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. Pastor Tim talked about that uh, last week. Let me read you Psalm 85, uh, 8 through 10. Read you here right now. I will listen to what the Lord God says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Verse 10. Love and faithfulness meet together. Listen to that. Love of God and faithfulness to God meet together. Love and faithfulness to God meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Pursuing righteousness and peace kiss each other. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. Uh, John eight forty seven. Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is you are not of God, Jesus said. Whoever thinks, listen again, this is the words of Jesus moving right out of Psalm 85 to John 8. Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is you're not of God. You claim to have a relationship you don't have because you've reduced it all to obedience in your own power, in your own might, by your own. Uh, <clears throat> Hebrews 2.1, therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard lest we drift away. You'll have a common drift away from these precepts. Hebrews 3.15, as it is said today, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts in rebellion. Listen for his voice and don't harden your hearts in rebellion. Proverbs uses this metaphor, don't despise wisdom. You're going to naturally want to despise wisdom because I've got it together. I know what I'm doing. Leave me alone. Psalm 32, 8 through 11, very quickly. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. God's saying we're developing a friendship while I instruct and teach you in the way you should go. I counsel you with a loving eye. Do not be like the horse or the mule which have no understanding but must be controlled by bit and bridle or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing all you are upright in heart. Rejoice if you don't cherish evil in your heart. Rejoice in the Lord and thank him that he's given you this heart that does this. Um, whew, uh, seeking God's face. Oh, man. Um, I'm going to have to do this quick. Um, the idiom in the Hebrew uh, is actually wanting an experience of God to affect your emotions. Some people call it the manifest presence of God. The fourth way to have a friendship with God is to actually seek an emotional connection with him. Not that you have to have it all the time, but that God will affect your emotions. Um, sometimes you have to feel the Lord. <laughs> you know, this is, I, the first time I heard this idiom spoken on, it was done by a Presbyterian. You know, they're the ones, the big knock on their denomination is they're the chosen frozen. There. <laughs> God is, you know. Uh, if God wants me to praise, he will force me to praise because I have no will. No, just, so, uh, sorry online. But, but I, wanted to I wanted to show you these two. There are two guys that are huge names for people of a Presbyterian background. Hugely effective preachers and authors. Jonathan Edwards and John Owen. And both of them said the same thing. You've got, you've got to put the notes down and feel his presence. You gotta have something, you have to have God affect your emotions. That is what seeking God's face is. That is a part of the friendship with God. Even an invisible, largely inaudible being. Jonathan Edwards, John Owen. Uh, last, you see Jesus' life and work as your ultimate friendship. 
Uh, one of my favorite commentators is a guy named Derek Kidner. Done work on the Psalms for 30 years. Uh, brilliant, brilliant Bible commentator. Listen uh, to what Kidner said. Meditate on Jesus' death and his resurrection as an act of friendship. Right? He says, what are the two main features of friendship? There's more than this, but he says candor and constancy. Right? They will tell you the truth and they'll, con- they'll be there for you. They won't let you down. And he says, always let you into their lives and never rarely let you down. Jesus was this for us. Always let you in, never let you down. So you trust him. You trust him with your life. You trust him with, uh, with, <laughs> with keeping his word and obeying him. Look, if you're listening to God, you're going to have to, how do you get to know somebody? You get to know what they like. In a relationship with God, it's okay. I, this is why Jesus said you gotta, I mean, obey Obedience is recognizing who I am. Obedience is part of it. So um, another way to put this is if he suffered unimaginably like that for me, I can surely suffer this smaller thing for him. He did this as a friend. He wanted to establish relationship. This is the unique beauty of Christianity. Sets it apart from any other major religious tradition. We're gonna end uh, tonight. I'm gonna uh, skip past. We're gonna end tonight uh, on, uh, and I, Pastor Russell closes this out when I'm finished um, we're going to end tonight on probably the most, um, the most uh, authored psalm, the most popular psalm is Psalm 23. I could give you a list of secularists that say it's the greatest poem in ancient literature. Think about that, secularist. I don't know what it is. That's the greatest poem. It doesn't rhyme, right? That's not how Hebrews did poetry, right? But Psalm 23, giant, huge, really, really a, a, a very, very popular. More songs have been written to put the, that Psalm 23 run to music than any, other, than any of the other Psalms, any of them. So I wanted you to watch tonight. I could have chosen one that had the performers, uh, but I'd rather you look at the words and listen to the song. This is a song uh, by, by uh, an artist, a, a faithful artist over the years named Phil Wickham. It's on Psalm 23. So if you have notes, put them down. Enjoy Psalm 23. And then uh, Pastor Russell, pray us out. Thank you guys. The Lord is my shepherd, there's nothing I need You lead me to the safest places You lead me to the safest places to walk in the meadow and lie by the stream You meet me in the quiet places You meet me in the quiet places Your goodness and your mercy will follow me All the days of my life All the days of my life And I'll dwell Eternity, I'll be there by your side. I'll be there by your side. Though I walk through the valley, the shadow of death, I don't have to fear no evil, for I know that you are. With the way
I'm Pastor Carrie right here at First Assembly. Thank you so much for joining us and being a part of our service today. I just wanna encourage you on your journey with the Lord and I wanna take some time right now and pray for you. Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for every single person that's watching. God, I pray a blessing over them. I thank you for your presence in and through their lives. And I, God, I pray over the word that has been spoken, Lord, that it would not return void and not return empty to them. I pray a blessing upon their week and in everything that they have going on. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have any questions about today's service, please feel free and visit our website at famfm.com. We also have an app, so feel free and download that as well and visit our social media pages for more updates on what's going on here at First Assembly. Again, thank you so much for joining us. It was so great to be with you. God bless you and have a wonderful week.